So let's all please kindly come close together. Barakallahu feekum. Make your brothers in the back, in the lobby. And all sit together, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم رب شح لي صدري وسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا معلمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا معلمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا معلمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا ما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا اللهم نور قلوبنا بعلم واستعمل أبداننا لطاعتك ووفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والعمل والنية والهدى إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم ألهمنا مراشد أمورنا وأعذنا من شرور أنفسنا آمين رب العالمين Respected elders and brothers, mothers and sisters, dear listeners السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Let's all make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes our coming into this gathering of knowledge and dhikr a means of our forgiveness, a means of our salvation, a means of rejuvenating our iman in our hearts and a means of us gaining that sixth sense whereby we can differentiate between right and wrong and where we can easily understand the plots and the plans of shaitan and our nafs against us and then may He inspire us to be able to protect ourselves and take the proper steps to protect ourselves from these plots and plans. Amin, Rabbil Alameen. Also, let us always, let us renew our in- intention that we're here to only please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, and to be able to, do, to gain so much ilm and through, through so much dhikr that this will become a means of us uh, gaining Allah's pleasure and then we will propagate this to others. And let us also make niyyah that, Ya Allah, whatever issues and difficulties this week I'm going through to the barakah of this gathering, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, may He remove those obstacles uh, and difficulties from our life. Ameen, Abul Alameen. We are going to, inshallah, continue from uh, the ayah, Qala amantum lahu qabla an a'adhana lakum. This one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال آمنتم له قبل أن آذن لكم إنه لكبيركم الذي علمكم السحر Fir'aun said to the magicians as you remember they all fell into prostration فألقي سحرا they all fell down and it was as though they were being forced by the power of the truth to fall into sujood and they said in all in one voice that we believed in the Rabb of Muharun and Musa so uh, alama, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in Tafsir of Jalalain, it's mentioned in the Hashia there. These are yani, wisdoms and hikam that scholars have written. From uh, yesterday, we sp- last week, we spoke about why quickly, how quickly these people accepted Islam. And one of the things, if you remember, was they were searching for the truth, right? That's what it was. They were experts of what they were doing, and they immediately saw that this is not magic, this is something else. And uh, we want the truth. So they were sincere, even though they were magicians, and they were magicians of Fir'aun, but they were sincere people wanting the truth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them that. And so we talked about that extensively, the fact that if a person is seeking the truth, no matter what his situation is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide him to that. So it reminds me of a story of Mulana Yunus Palanpuri. Some of you know him, Ek Minat Ka Sabak, or Aaj Ka Sabak. It's a very famous daily lesson he shares. He records a clip in Urdu, and it's shared on his, broadcasted on various um, you know, uh, applications. So uh, one, one time I was sitting in a talk of his and he mentioned that he was uh, traveling to Africa for an ishtima, for da'wah. And in the plane, he was sitting next to a uh, evangelical Christian priest uh, or, um, or, or a church leader. And they were speaking uh, in a ni- long conversation on the flight to Africa. And he asked, what are you going for, etc. And he said, you know, I'm going to the various parts of Africa or some specific part of Africa to go spread Christianity and usually to go out into very difficult areas. 
So the Mawlana Sahib said also, you know, I'm also going to Africa, but you know, to spread the deen. So they had a conversation about Islam and Christianity and so forth. Long conversation about all of these things. And they got along quite well. You speak from different perspectives, they're speaking about. As they landed there, Mawlana Sahib said that I told this, this, this evangelical Christian priest or leader that w I'm going to end this conversation, this nice friendship that we had. You know, on this plane, on this journey, I want to end this conversation on one thing. Eight hour flight, spending time with each other. You know, I don't know if any of you have had these long flights with next to people and you get, start getting along quite well, and it's like, wow, I just, you know, the arwahum junudum mujannada, as the Prophet said, souls are like an army that has been gathered together. There are some souls that get along, and there are some souls that don't get along. So sometimes you say, <laughs> Yeah, I was telling the students today, love at first sight. It's actually not love at first sight, it's love at second sight. The first sight happened where? In the realm of souls. Right? You saw each other there and you connected. You don't remember that. But that's the reason when you look at someone, you're like, oh my God, this person my, is just like, I have to be with this person. Or we get along so well. Have we met before? It seems like we're brothers. It seems like we know each other from years. That's because the souls met in the realm of souls. And they got along over there. And then when you meet up again here, it's just you hit off on the right note immediately. On the flip side of it, minha makhtalaf. There are some that don't, didn't get along over there. You know, they, they kind of were in a tight spot. They elbowed each other or something like that. So now when they see each other from the very get-go, they just don't get along. Always irritated by one another. So this, this, this scholar of Islam sitting with this Christian evangelical priest on the same flight going to Africa, give, to both doing different things, to give da'wah to people, one towards Islam, one towards Christianity. And the journey, you know, ends now in Africa and they're parting ways so Mulana, uh, Yunus tells this, 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 uh, this um, <clears throat> priest that, listen man we had enjoyed our conversation I want to tell you one thing can I ask you to do one thing and he said yeah what is that he said you go ahead do whatever you think you're doing fine I'm not, I can't stop you but I request you that every single day take out a few moments you know special moments before you go to bed or etc take out some few moments every single day and raise your hand and pray to Allah or pray to God, pray to the Almighty, pray to the divine power that God guide me to what's right. Whatever is right, just guide me to that. And make this earnest prayer and dua every single day. Can you do this? And he said, yeah, I'm not asking you to accept Islam. I'm not asking you to invite yourself to Islam. I said, just ask God to guide you to what's right. So he said, okay, I'll do this. And subhanAllah, I'm, I'm hearing from the man himself, Mulana Yunus, in his talk. He said, years later, <clears throat> I received a handwritten letter. And the letter, when I opened it, was from that same person, from that same priest. And he told me he's writing a letter, interestingly, from where? From in a flight, from an airplane. And where is he headed? To Africa. And for what? To spread Islam. He had accepted Islam, and he said, I'm going to go right back to the areas I've gone to, and I, Allah has blessed me with Islam and, uh, and has blessed me with the nur of Islam, with the light of Islam. And I'm going right back to the areas where I had gone to before to spread this deen. SubhanAllah. Where, where does this come back to? It comes down to sincerity. When a person is sincere and wanting Allah, then no matter how challenging the circumstances may be, Allah will make a way for him. What did Asiya have? The wife of Fir'aun. Right? It was sincerity of hers. She had, you say, oh, I've got difficult circumstances. Or, you know, some women who are listening to me may say, I have a difficult husband. Yes. Some husbands may say, I have a difficult wife. Yes. But who can say they have a more difficult spouse than Pharaoh, the Pharaoh himself? I am your supreme God. You know, right? My husband thinks he's to be, to be God. No, he didn't. He actually proclaimed it. He said, I am God. I am your supreme Lord. That's what he would say. He told everyone. He acted like God. He, you know, he wanted to kill whoever he wanted, did whatever he wanted. He oppressed the, Bani, the, the, the Israelites for years. So that's your husband. How challenging it must be to have him in your life and you want to remain a Muslim. Allahu Akbar. Most difficult. But guess what? She remained a Muslim until even though she, he warned her, intimidated her, that I'm going to burn you to death. I'm going to boil you to death. I'm going to do everything imagined. And nothing sh shook her faith. She remained firm and she died in that state eventually. But her name is mentioned uh, يعني, or her reference to her is mentioned in the Quran. وَمْرَأَةُ فِرْعَوْنَ إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ ابْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ Oh Allah, please build for me a palace by you in paradise. By you in paradise. I did all this for you. 
Not for paradise. I did this for you. I want to be next to you. I want to be near you as much as it could possibly be in the next world. Please give me respite. No, rather, give me, give, save me. When a genie, give me, give me a chance to escape min Fir'aun from Fir'aun wa'amali and from his horrible actions. What happened? She didn't just disappear into the sky and he was like, oh, where's my wife? No, she was burnt to death. She was boiled to death. She was killed. But that was the, you're not going to see her dua being accepted. What could Fir'aun do? He couldn't burn her a second time, he couldn't torture her a second time. That painful five minutes, ten minutes were definitely super duper duper painful. But that's it. You only got one life. He couldn't do it again. As much as he wants to. Please save me from Fir'aun and his horrible actions. And save me from the oppressive nations. He's, she's mentioned in Surah Tahrim. So that is what you get from sincerity. That if you're sincere, then no matter what type of circumstances you find yourself in, you will be able to practice Islam and the deen. And if we're not sincere, may Allah forgive and protect us, then you could be born in Mecca, and you could be born in Medina, and your father and mother could be like the servants of, of, of the haram, and cleaning and taking care of the haram. They could be, you could be imam of the haram. It doesn't make a difference. But if a person is not sincere, then the proximity to these sacred places will make no difference. He will still remain far away from Islam. So, Fir'aun... To, said now to these magicians Amantum lahu Have you believed In him Have you believed in him Before I have permitted you to do so How dare Every single thing I'm complete I'm supposed to be completely in control Of every movement of yours Including your emotions Including your faith How dare can you believe in Musa Before you take permission from me Guess what Indeed he is certainly your Master sorcerer He is actually the biggest magician of all he is actually the biggest magician of all. Who has taught you sorcery? So now when you don't have a proper answer, this is what you do. Why don't you deal with that? Why don't you sit there and speak to your own people who have forsaken you? Why did you all do this? Seriously, am I right? All, all hundreds of you have left me to go to with Musa? Hmm, this seems to be a little odd. Even though you know I'm going to kill you. And I had, I had promised you all sorts of rewards if you, if you win. Why would you do this? There must be some serious reason why you, you, you have changed sides. But when a person follows his ego, is narcissistic, unfortunately, what happens? It, narcissism, it blinds you. Right? It blinds you from the truth. This is, may Allah protect us from narcissism. Right? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all from amongst those who are always searching and seeking for the truth, even if it means it's against us. Because we want to be on the truth. We want to die on the right side of the fence. We want to die on the right side of history. So if we're making mistakes, ask Allah for guidance that you're able to see your own wrong. Not that I have to be stubborn in my ways and regardless of whether I'm right or wrong. So stubbornness is a very big bimari, big, big disease. Right? Stubbornness. This is seriously a big problem. You know, sometimes we, 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 you know, we, we say I'm stubborn, but actually that's not good. We should seek refuge in Allah Azawajal from being stubborn. Yes, be stubborn on the truth. I agree. Be firm. You're going to call it firm. Firm on the truth. Don't be wishy-washy. But when it comes to general things, we should be open-minded to say, if I am if I'm, uh, wrong, then I am willing to accept my wrong. And I'm not going to say that this is how it is, my way or the highway. So instead of learning and thinking about the truth, immediately he said, Musa is you actually your teacher, your biggest magician. Now, what am I going to do to all of you? Therefore, I shall indeed cut off your hands. Aidiyakum, your hands. Wa'arjulakum, and your feet. Min khilaf, not just hands and feet, min khilaf from opposite sides. Right hand, left foot, left hand, right foot. Lauqatiana, this lamb and this noon tak in mushaddad is for emphasis. Wherever you see this. So, لَأُقَطِّعَنَّا Most definitely, indeed, I shall cut your hands and feet from the opposite sides. And not stopping there. وَلَأُصَلِّبَنَّكُمْ And most definitely, most surely, I shall crucify you. Salib sol, sol, is called the cross. The crucifix. Salib. So, لَأُصَلِّبَنَّكُمْ I shall most certainly crucify you. فِي جِذْعٌ جِذْعٌ is the trunks. Nakhl is date palm trees. Date palms. I'm going to crucify you on the trunks of date palms so that everyone can see what happens if you leave Fir'aun's religion and you follow the deen of Musa alayhi salam. 
pretty uh, you know, da- uh, scary what he said he's doing. Now, the magicians, they know Fir'aun. They know he means business. They've been, they've been working for him for years. So they know like you have these cartel leaders, ruthless people. Anyone who works for them knows exactly how ruthless they are. An outsider will never think, will never imagine how ruthless they are. So Fir'aun's people know how ruthless he is. When he, when he says something, he'll do it. He's not, he's not bluffing. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, وَلَا تَعْلَمُنَّ أَيُّنَا أَشَدُّ عَذَابُ أَبْقَى And he says, you will know that who amongst us is more severe inflicting torment and making pain more everlasting. Who is he comparing himself to? He says, you will know who amongst us. What is he, what is he referring here to? Anyone? You will know, O oh magicians, who amongst us is more severe in inflicting torment and making pain more everlasting? Huh? Exactly. So you, you went towards Allah, the Rabb of Musa, okay, fine. I'm your God, but you forgot me and you went towards the Rabb of Musa, Allah Well, guess what? You're going to have to learn the hard way who has got the more power, greater power in inflicting torment. Is it the Rabb of Musa or is it Fir'aun? And Abqa, and you have to, you'll learn the hard way Whose punishment is more everlasting? Is it my punishment longer, longer lasting? Or the Lord of Fir'aun, I'm sorry, the Lord of Musa is his uh, punishment everlasting? What an amazing answer. We're talking about people accepted Islam how long ago? They accepted Islam like five minutes ago. Right? And what are they telling Fir'aun? They said, We will never prefer submission to you. Means to give preference. Ithar, to give preference to someone over yourself. We shall never give preference to you. We will never prefer submission to you. Ala, over. Over what? Ma'ja'ana Over all those clear and miraculous proofs of Allah that have come to us, meaning that Musa has brought to us. And وَالَّذِي فَطَرَنَا أَيْ لَنْ نُؤْثِرَكَ عَلَى الَّذِي فَطَرَنَا We will never give you preference and never give uh, we will never prefer submission to you over the one who has originated us. So you just came out of nowhere. There's a God who created you and I. Why would we run towards you and leave the one who created us? Similarly, when we have clear proof, the proof is in the pudding. Look what just happened, man. Are you, are you blind? Did you not just see what happened to his, his snake? It's not a snake. It's something else. It ate all of our snakes, all of our staffs, instantaneously gone. How could you be so blinded from the truth? Like this telescope, the satellite pictures that are coming in, imagery that is coming in. People are sitting there amazed. People are getting emotional. People are crying. And they say, look what science has shown us. Brother, science didn't create a star. Science didn't create a galaxy. Science didn't create anything that's out there. Science, Allah, is just a tool for us to see Allah's power. How sad that, the, that, that no matter how powerful $10 billion satellite is, and no matter how clear, crystal clear the lens of those satellites are, but if the lens of the heart is cloudy, you still won't see Allah after seeing all this. Now people getting emotional at the pictures, but they can't think that who's the one who created all of this. If this is so beautiful and overwhelming, Imagine how beautiful and overwhelming must be the one who created all this. The mind is working 24-7. Hundreds and thousands of people. Billions of dollars being spent to go look at what's at the end, other end of the space. And Allah says, سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَهُمْ أَنَّ الْحَقِّ What an amazing ayah. Listen to this. سَنُرِيهِمْ Soon we shall show them. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا Our signs. سَنُرِيهِمْ Soon we shall show them. آيَاتِنَا Our signs. سَنُرِيهِمْ آيَاتِنَا فِي الْآفَاقِ In the distant corners of the horizon. وَفِي أَنفُسِهِمْ And we'll show them our signs within their own selves. Their own lives, their own body, their own anatomy, their own psychology, their own biology will be an amazing manifestation of my signs. Hatta, How long am I keep on showing this? يَتَبَيَّنَا Until it will become completely apparent. أَنَّهُ الْحَقِّ that Allah is the absolute truth. Now you don't want to accept it, that's up to you. But it, this will be absolutely established that Allah is the ultimate truth. 
أَوَلَمْ يَكْفِي بِرَبِّكَ أَنَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ شَهِيدٍ Isn't it sufficient that your Lord is a witness to all of these things? Your Lord is the biggest witness that you have seen this, you acknowledge it, Allah forbid, and the, but those people, they, they, the, the lens of the heart is cloudy. So they just don't get it. We don't look down upon anyone. We simply thank Allah countless number of times that we don't have to understand and see satellite imagery to understand He exists. We see Allah everywhere. In the way your day began, in the way your day is ending, in the way you're sitting here today. We see Allah everywhere. And how? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to see Him. You have to have that lens. You know, if you want to see a 3D uh, presentation, a video, you're not going to be able to see that without wearing those 3D lenses. You just can't. You'll be sitting there and say, I don't see it, I don't see it. Do all you want. You're never going to see it the way it's supposed to be seen if you're missing those lenses. Similarly, if we're missing the lens of guidance, the lens of hidayah from Allah, then even the greatest of things will just not make sense to us. So we ask Allah that He always keeps us, keeps our lens clean and keeps, gives us those lens where we can see guidance and see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hidden hand behind everything. So these new Muslims who have accepted Islam five minutes ago, what are they saying? We will not, give, we will not prefer submitting to you over the clear proofs that Allah has come to, brought to us. Where are your proofs? You haven't brought proofs. You know, people say, I'm very logical. I'm very logical. Well, guess what? Why don't, you, why don't we, they use the logic in a proper sense? If you're very logical, where's the proof? Yeah, if you have, like, subhanAllah, that's why it's, you're not logical. That's wrong. That's a lie. You're logical. Brothers who are in the back are coming forward. Please come sit forward. Let's not have any, ba- let's, let's not have any spaces in between, gaps in between. Inshallah, you'll benefit a lot more if you move forward. Any of the youngsters who are sitting against the wall, if you, got, you broke your back or hurt your back, may Allah grant you shifa, may Allah grant you cure, may Allah grant you strength. But if you didn't hurt your back, then come closer, inshallah, and sit as close as possible to the crowd. Jazakumullah khaira. May Allah reward all of you. And the sisters as well, if you're here in the prayer hall, wherever you're you know, sitting, make a habit not to sit in your own corners. That's not the etiquette. Wherever we're sitting, let's sit together as close as possible, inshallah. In any Islamic gathering we attend, sit always as close as possible. So uh, one, one uh, um, scholar recently told me that there is, a young, there is a Muslim group in that area and he said there is a 16 year old who shows up to the me- weekly meets of this young Muslim group of youth. And he said this kid is 16 or 15, is a member of, that, of the community, is a young, youngster of that community who has now become an atheist. Okay, now what he does, he comes weekly to the meet and all he does is he creates doubts and confusion amongst all the kids. So he said, the Imam said, I said, okay, listen, man, why, why are you picking on little kids? You're confused, you're picking on, why don't you come talk to me? They won't do that, right? So he said, come talk to the Imam. So I said, I called, called him into the office, I said, what's your problem? What are you confused about? Let's talk. So he said, he, he mentioned to me this, this criticism, this objection, this criticism, this objection. One after another, I started, <coughs> I started answering him. Until I answered everything, he had nothing to say. And he just looks at the translation of the Qur'an behind me, you know, on the Imam's desk, and he says, Oh, I just don't believe that stuff. It's all fake. Okay, what is this statement supposed to mean? Don't just say it's all fake. Where's the proof? What objection do you have? I'm here to answer it. I've answered all your objections, broke all your fallacies. What, bring in something. He has nothing to bring. Because this is, they're not being logical. They're not being very enlightened. They actually have actually become slaves of their desires. That's what it is. Slave of their desire and slave of their aql. Slave of their intelligence, not intelligence, their logic. And slave of their desires. When a person becomes a slave of his desire, then it's very hard to acknowledge there's a creator. Because why? Acknowledging a creator that is all powerful means you have to be humble and you gotta follow the rules. People don't like to follow the rules today. Asal bati, you wanna know the real reason why atheism is spreading like a wildfire more faster than the California wildfires? Why? Because people have become slaves of the, their nafs and don't want to listen to anyone. They don't want to listen to their parents. They don't want to listen to their teachers. They don't want to listen to their mentors. They don't want to listen to their elders. And they want to be completely in control of themselves. I, I just felt like it. That's what they want to do. Why are you doing this? I just feel like it. But why? I don't know. Just, just do what I want to be to do anything, anywhere, anytime, the way I want it. You see this generation today hates following rules. They get so upset. Anything you tell them, 
They get angry about everything. They're not accustomed to following rules. What is that? Because ye, the past 10, 15 years that they have been raised, raised in this environment in the world, not just the United States, they have become so accustomed to following their desires. That's what shaitan is doing right now. This whole thing of, I don't listen to my mom, I don't need to listen to my mom and dad. I don't need to listen to my teachers. I don't need to listen to my mentors. SubhanAllah, I'm telling you, people of, forget outsiders. People of knowledge who study the deen, they're acting like this today. People study the Quran for a few years, they become half of the Quran. People study the ilm. You tell them today, hey, you have, do you have a mentor? Do you have somebody you make mashwara with? No, I don't need to. I'm being honest. How many imams of the country have a mentor? How many ulama of the country have mentors? How many of them humble themselves in front of someone and say, you know what, I need to sit down and talk to someone. I'm always giving lectures and talks, but where do I get to purify myself? Where do I get a, if I'm, if I'm a tanker giving gas to everyone else, when do I fill up myself, my tank? So at all levels, from, a, from ground level to the top, everyone thinks. I met one elderly scholar in this country, subhanAllah. And once we were in his masjid, he was so humble. He told me to lead salah. I was like, no, man, I mean, you're the elder imam over here. He said, no, 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 I want you to lead. Afterwards, he sat me down. I was with the students. He told me, you know, he came to this country in the 60s or 70s, senior. And he told me, he said, Is mulk andar sabse bada masla pata hai kya hai? Hamara koi bada nahi hai. Jiski wajah se hi sara kuch bigada hai. Right? He said, in this country, we have no elder. We, he's to, and he's being humble talking about himself. But yeah, obviously, if, it's, if he's saying in his 70s or 60s, that he doesn't have an elder, what about me? Right? I mean, the idea is that generally speaking, people do not have high regards for anyone. Anyone, you say, ah, ah, it's okay, man. It's okay. It's okay. Everyone, it's okay. So who, who, do you, who do you humble yourself in front of? That's the whole point. As if we don't have it. Whoever doesn't have an elder, his elder is shaitan. Who doesn't ever have an emir, who doesn't ever have a mentor, whoever doesn't have a sheikh, his mentor is who? Is shaitan. Remember that word. That's exactly true. That is real business. You cannot function in life without having someone you speak with and you take mashwara from. And the reason why this is not happening today is because tr slowly the entire world is going towards following the nafs and the desires. And that's exactly, give it a few more, you know, a little bit more time. And that's when the Jal will show up. Because he'll, he will he'll be, the, he'll be the perfect thing to fill up that vacuum. Because people will no longer be believing in a divine. Right? You will see how artificial intelligence and all of these other things will, will gather together and the Dajjal will come about at a, just the perfect right time. Whenever that is, may Allah save us and take us away way before that time. I mean, Rabbil Alameen. Right? So, the idea is, The one who cannot thank the people cannot thank Allah. If someone cannot be thankful to his parents or to his teachers, how can he be ever be thankful to Allah? So, now if the people of knowledge don't have a shaykh, don't have a mentor, okay? And that's exactly why you see the deviation between in the people of knowledge today. Why you see the deviation? As an outsider, as an elderly uncle, you're sitting there, you're saying, man, 30 years, people have changed a lot. How come this person started from here, ended up over there? There's no anchor anymore. There's no anchor. If you have an anchor, that stops you from going too far off. But if you're not anchored to anything, you just go with the flow. That's what it is. No, they, like you put a boat in the middle without an anchor, or you put something that's floating there, it's gonna, the winds will just take it away to the other side. Before you know it's on the other end of the sea. Other end of the river, of course. But if you're anchored, then subhanAllah, even the winds will come, waves will come, you'll stay strong. What is your anchor? Your anchor is your teachers. Your anchor are your mentors. Your anchor are your shayukh. Your anchor are your parents. Who are all obviously anchored by someone else. Anchored upon. So that's why get connected to the connected. Get connected to the connected. Otherwise, you will become, as our teachers would say, um, uh, what do they say? Katipatan. What is that? It means a, a, uh, a kite that's been cut. Now, I don't think they fly kites anymore, it seems like. I don't, it, growing up, I'm not that old, but subhanAllah, I remember it was such a normal thing to fly kites. Guys, kids, youth, do they people fly kites still? No? On the internet, you fly kites? Oh, okay. Must be some video game. Yeah? Is there some video game of flying kites? No? Computer game for flying kites? No? Okay. So there was a, once upon a time, go check online about what flying kites used to look like. You'd go and you go buy a kite and you go outside in the open area, ideally, and you go fly a kite. It would be very fun. SubhanAllah, I still remember with my father, we used to go buy those uh, things from Toys R Us and we used to fly those 500 feet, 500 feet threads. Then we used to get a 250 feet thread and a 1,000 feet thread, SubhanAllah. And it was, it was very fun, especially in the windy city of Chicago. It's a perfect thing. I don't know why it died out. I guess phones have taken over. Probably, that's why. Right? So, amongst many other things. So, 
in India and Pakistan and here too as well, you know, uh, to a certain degree was that when you're flying kites, they used to, tr <laughs> they, they, my father and my elders will say this, that they, they, you know, they used to have a competition of trying to cut each other's string. So some people would do something very dangerous, which was they used to put chopped pieces of glass. Is that correct? Did you ever do that? Huh? No? You didn't do that, but you know. So is that, I don't know how common that was, but I've heard stories like this. Oh, okay. They used to put it only in Punjabis. Huh? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gujarat, they used to have something like this? Huh? They, all over, huh? Okay. So, yeah. No, Bangladesh? Yes, okay, right. <laughs> Bangladesh also has it, okay. I don't know if, huh? Okay, that's what it's called? No, right. So they put this a broken piece of glass on it, and then you go and you cut the other guy's uh, string. You got it? So you win. So... What happens anyway if, for us, for me, I, I never did that, but obviously what happened, our thread would get stuck uh, somewhere in a, in a tree or something like that or far away over a pond and then you'd have to cut it because it's like, what's good? We don't, even know, we don't even know where the kite went into our neighbor's lawn many times. So what happened is when, this, when the thread is cut from the kite and the kite's already at three, four hundred feet, it's called a kati patang, right? The kite has been cut. So now it flies all over. Ooh, mashallah, look, it's going high, 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 high. How long is that going to last? It lasts for one minute, two minutes, three minutes. It flies even higher at times because now it's not longer anchored to the ground or no longer anchored to you as you're holding it down. It's cut. So it goes higher. But how long? For a few more minutes. And after that, it falls into the pond, it falls into the tree, it falls into the ditch, and done. So the, our teachers would say, if you graduate from the madrasa, and for that matter for anyone, and you don't keep yourself anchored to your teachers, you will be the katipatan. You'll go fly. You'll say, oh, my teachers hold me down. My mentors, my parents hold me down. Come on, man. I want to grow. I want to grow. And you'll grow, grow, and you think you'll be growing. You got big followership online. You've got a lot of people around you, and you become famous. You're growing, growing, growing. But if you're cut, it's just a matter of time when you will fall. And you will fall, number one, spiritually. You'll be spiritually bankrupt. You'll be flying without gas. All right? It's just a show. But internally, you won't be able to benefit people, actually. And most importantly, you won't be able to benefit yourself. What's the point of benefiting others who can't benefit yourself? So this is the dilemma of the world today. That most people have become cut kites that are just flying around without anchored, being anchored. So this is the advice to myself and all of us who are listening here. That make sure you connect yourself with your parents, with your elders, with your teachers, with your mashayikh, with someone in your life. And not say, I'm going to do this myself. Many times students will... Uh, you know, the, why I, I cry about this issue is this is happening in our seminary. Graduated students, graduating students, current students, when they have this dini environment, I can only imagine what must be the world outside. When they, all, they have all the exposure, yet shaitan is so strong, doesn't make them understand what they need to do. The people who have never had this exposure, the beautiful exposure that seminary students get, how far off do you think they end up going? Right? Because they've never even seen what it means to have a mentor or a sheikh or a scholar or a teacher. And so they're just, there's a huge disconnect in there. So it is responsibility of the fathers and mothers who are listening here and the adults who, and the youngsters who have some understanding that create this mizaj and temperament within your, student, within your sons and daughters. That pooch pooch ke chalo. Right? Keep on asking as you move forward. Don't try to do things without asking. You don't have to ask me. You don't have to ask you. Find someone. But have someone to make mashura with. Otherwise, and, and don't just come and inform. Sometimes people come and inform. Oh, by the way, I'm marrying someone. Oh, no, it's too late now. Why? If I know a whole bunch of stuff too, I can't say anything. You already announced you're coming with the wedding card, and you're telling me this is what's happening. Like some of you are thinking, "Oh my God, did this happen?" No, I'm not saying specifics here. And like just generally speaking, people come and they and they say, "I've decided to go into this field." Why well, graduated from finance, Sheikh? I can't find a halal job. Hi, four four years ago, if you had made some mashwara of what to do, it would have been nice. Now you're graduated finance major. Uh, or something else, and all you're getting the jobs is credit card companies and banks, and then you're coming and asking for, can you please give me some fatwa? Why didn't you take mashura before? So when it comes to which university, which, which, w to which investment, to which career path, to which spouse, all of those things, let's make a habit of asking. Subhanallah. That was an interesting point that I wanted to mention. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make it easy for me to uh, practice on what I just shared and allow all of us to practice on, 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 on this as well. So when we have an elder, what happens? Then you will not be following your hawa. Mufti Taqi Uthmani. Sorry, another story here. Mufti Taqi Uthmani is, you know, one of the most notable scholars of the world, or rather, not just scholars. 
He's one of the top one or two, most uh, top two or three uh, most, from the 500 list of most influential and well-known Muslims across the globe. Either he's number two or he's number one or something like that. But chief mufti of Pakistan. As a student, he got bayar to his, his father is who? His father is the mufti of Pakistan. Mufti Shafi. But he said, listen, you know, father and son, it's hard for sometimes for the children to benefit from their dads. So no matter who your father is. So he, he, he wanted him to, he connected him with all the different mashayikh. So he ended up getting bay'ah and took uh, a, a pledge of, of, of tawbah and, and pledge of uh, tarbiyah under Dr. Abdul Hay Arifi, rahmatullahi alayhi, who was a doctor, who was a hakim, hakim as well, hakim. So he took bay'ah his hands. So Dr. Abdul Hay Arifi told him, mashallah, you're, you can imagine Mufti Taqi how he must have been in his 20s, right? He's bubbling with knowledge and excitement and everything. He gave him, he said, okay, if I don't remember the exact number of years, it could have been 10. Right, I, uh, I, stand, I, could, I could be corrected for that. But he said, for 10 years, you are not going to go on the pulpit. No bayans for you. 10 years, no bayans. Right, you simply focus on what I'm going to tell you to focus on. But lectures and talks, you stop doing that. Imagine someone who is the son of the Grand Mufti of the country, who himself is so advanced at his knowledge, a sheikh says, no, no more bayans. And you just say, Sami'ana wa ta'ana. I listen and obey. However great you were, you became a hundred times greater at that moment. For you to be able to put your nafs down and say, I, I serve Allah, and I'm, I, the whole purpose of a talk and a lecture is to get closer to Allah. If my elders tell me no, then it's a no. Because I'm not doing it for myself. I'm doing it for Allah. And so that's why you will see in these people, you go sit with them, my beloved brothers and sisters, you have a chance to go sit. May Allah give long life, barakah to Mufti Taqi Uthmani. And may Allah all of us to, <clears throat> I have this heart's desire that one day he comes here. Although it seems very difficult, but nothing is difficult for Allah. So I want you all to make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up the way for him and my Ustad Mufti Rada al Haq. And also Damud Barakatum to come visit us here, inshallah, one day. You know, we believe in miracles. Inshallah, there are many pious people sitting here and listening. You all make dua that Allah opens up the doors for this type of event to happen here, inshallah. So, uh, when you sit with such people, one thing you will not for one instant smell arrogance. Even though they are mountains of knowledge, mountains of, 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 of everything. You have prime ministers, you have presidents, you have multi millionaires, you have billionaires coming for advice. And you think, my God, look at the type of people that are coming. As, as an outsider, bystander, any of you have spent time with these two people, of you, you realize the guest list who are coming to say, get their duas, get their permission, get their advice. It's like the who's who of the country are coming. And you wonder, Yani, subhanAllah, like if this type of, if this guy's car were to drive by my house, I'd run out of the house and look at hey, look at the car. Huh? Look at that car. And these people are coming to their home to seek their advice. Imagine how their mind must be, like how the nafs huge must be. But you say, no, none of these guests have a teeny tiny effect on their humility and humbleness. They are, are as approachable, as down to earth as possible. Why is that? That's through the tarbiyah that they have gotten for years under their mentors and the shuyukh. If you don't get that tarbiyah, and if you don't get that refinement, then what will happen? The nafs will just become larger than you can imagine. So today, atheism is on the spread because of this one issue, the nafs, nafs, nafs. That youngster, 15-year-old, look at the audacity. He's speaking to a very knowledgeable mufti. After he breaks all his proofs, he says, I don't care. I don't believe in this stuff. Like, what's the reason? No reason. What is it? It's because I don't want a supreme being to tell me what I have to do. So I've asked people who've left Islam, why did you leave Islam? Multiple reasons for that. We always talk about these issues. We talk about doubts, we talk about desires, we talk about bad family structure. Like, you fall out from the family structure. But when they say desires, what I mean is some people say, that why is it that I sin and all my college mates sin? But when I come back home, all my college mates are snoring, sleeping deep, and I feel guilty as a Muslim why I did what they all did. So they say, now instead of feeling guilty for what I have done, I'd rather just say I'm no longer a Muslim. So then I can also sleep nicely without a conscious, my conscious gnawing at me. Without my conscious biting at me. So what is that? Again, because it makes you feel comfortable. It's just like, khalas, I'm going to follow my hawa. I don't, have, I don't feel God. One person actually told me this. He's like, every time I go to family gatherings, this, that, everyone's like, this is haram, that's haram. And I, I want to do everything. So I'm tired. Now I, I got the new answer. The new answer is, go, brother, keep your fatwa to yourself. I'm not a Muslim. This doesn't apply to me. This doesn't apply to me. I'm not a Muslim. Khalas, story end. The guy, of course, anyone you tell them to, he's, what do you think? He's going to back off. 
He'll try to get you, wake you up for Fajr, say, stop this, stop this, stop that. But if Allah forbid you say, give him an answer like this, he'll say, okay, fine, I'm, I don't even know what to say. So this is a tactic that youth are using today. And this is the reason, because the nafs has become too huge. So beloved fathers and mothers, please work on the nafs of our children. Don't let it become huge. Don't let them just say, I will do whatever I want. Because that is horrible. That's what you call following the nafs. If we don't, it's like a big boil. If you don't take care of it, it's going to get big, bigger, bigger, and burst. So whose responsibility of that is for the moms and dads to say, you're not going to get whatever you want. You cannot. Because otherwise, you will no longer be Abdullah, you'll become Abdul Hawa. No longer the Abd of God, you'll become the Abd of Allah. You, instead, you'll become Abd of the desires. So Musa alayhi salam, he, what he did, moved these people, and they said, we will never you know, follow you over them. And then this, this, this sex, sex, second portion here is so powerful. فَقْضِ مَا أَنْتَقَاض Look at this. فَقْضِ مَا أَنْتَقَاض How would you translate this? قَضَى يَقْضِي means to decree, to make a judgment. فقضي, make any decree you want. Basically, I would say this in Urdu. جو چاہے کرلو جو جی مائے کرلو ہم تو اسلام نہیں چھوڑنا والے. Do whatever you want. Make any decision you want. We're not leaving Islam. Within a few minutes, they, le- they reach this level of iman to say, فَقْضِ مَا أَنْتَقَاض Believe whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Oh, you said, are you going to crucify us? Okay. And you're going to cut our hands and feet from the opposite sides? Okay. You want to do something else? Do it. You want to do this? Do this? Do anything else? Subhanallah. What an answer. إِنَّمَا تَقْضِي هَذِي الْحَيَا dunya. You can only decree what happens in this world. Your judgment of killing, crucifixion, crucifixion, or any other type of torture will only affect us as long as the soul is in the body. And as soon as the soul leaves, it could take three minutes, it could take 30 minutes. As soon as the soul leaves the body, your jurisdiction is over, Fir'aun, done. You can't do anything to us. What an amazing answer. Beloved brothers and sisters, this ayah is so important for us. Because we are faced with difficulties at job, we're faced with difficulties at work, at school, in society. Where the society is pushing us to leave Islam, leave the deen, leave the sunnah. And we are trying our best as a small dwindling community to remain firm. And the opposition keeps on getting greater numbers. To the extent that our spouses are joining the opposite ranks. Our children are joining the opposite ranks. Our parents are joining the opposite ranks. Our co-workers and our employers are joining the opposite ranks. It's getting very difficult to follow the deen in this country. And if you want to see more difficulty, then you look at what's happening in India, what's happening in, in other parts of the world, some, you know, different parts of the world. SubhanAllah, people getting arrested for praying salah, right? You've all have heard, I'm sure you might know, you know. If you're praying in, a, praying in a train station, praying in a mall, they're getting arrested and tortured for simply praying salah. Wow, that's, that's a question now. What is, yani, this all of us, many of us are from that region of the world. Ask yourself if this type of rule were to happen, what, what are you going to do about your salah? Yes, you don't have to pray in public. That's true. Actually, uh, one of the ulama recently gave a talk. I'm just sharing this. And he said that, you know, um, senior alim of India, he said in this type of situations, then you can pray, for example, sitting on the train or, or whatnot, because <coughs> if you have to travel, but re- utilize whatever means you can because you have to follow the rules there. Right? You don't want, it's, it's, you're not supposed to get yourself in the jail and get tortured like that. Otherwise, you won't be able to follow any other aspect of the deen as well. You, will be, you won't be able to take care of your children. But does it mean you don't, you'll neglect your salah You'll have to figure out. I cannot imagine I'm saying these words and the ulama have to say these words. This is happening in the motherland, right? The place where this ilm that I'm sharing with you has come from. From that town, from those areas, this is what the world has changed to. Now, this ayah is important for us to reflect. The world is becoming more challenging, more difficult. During the Jal's time, what will happen? The hadith are there. The Jal will say, Follow me, otherwise you're dead. And what happens? Your entire system, your entire town, He's going to have full control over livestock, full control of the electric grid, full control of whatever, the food, everything, A to Z, vertical p- p- control, everything. And so with the blink of an eye, if you follow him, everything's going to flourish. And if you don't follow him, everything's going to fall apart. Where did this come from? This came from the power that Allah has given him. Of course, he's not God. Allah has made him as a test. So this ayah is asking you to reflect are you ready to look at the, those who don't follow the deen and those who are causing obstructions in your deen to say, You can decree whatever you want, I'm not changing. 
Or are we going to say, you know what, I'm going to have to budge. Today, unfortunately, too many of us are budging. Too many of us are budging in the matters of deen. And this is surah is, is a very powerful, this specific ayah is a very powerful reminder that please remain firm. One thing I told you, I didn't, Jalalain tafsir. Remember I said about Jalalain? Then I didn't say what was written there. He said one of the reasons that, one of the possible wisdoms why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also could have given hidayah or hidayah came quickly to the magicians were that they were dressed in robes similar to the robe of Musa alayhi salam. And so they say that external similarity with Musa alayhi salam became a means of hidayah coming towards them quicker. And so based on this they would say that even if a person is not necessarily the most pious person and the most sunnah following person, but if you dress according to the salaf or dress the way the scholars, of, of the, of, of the scholars would dress, then what will happen? Hidayah will inshaAllah come down to us as well. You don't have to say, you say, brother, I'm very weak. So why should I, I dress in a certain manner? Uh, I, you know, why should I uh, wear a turban? Why should I wear a kufi? What not? These are all sunnah of the Prophet Who said you have to be pious for that? You have to start somewhere. You can say, Allah, I'm going to adorn my exterior and you adorn my interior because I have no control of my interior. I, you have control of my interior. I have control over my wardrobe. I don't have control over my heart. Yeah? So I'm going to dress what I can control of. With, with, according to the sunnah. With, a, with, with what the ulama, with the, what the salaf and the righteous, pious people say, the pious of the town, whatever the pious of the town wear, the pious of the town wear, you go dressed in that manner. And then you say, Allah, this is an appearance, external appearance, I want you to change my internal appearance. There's a lot of discussion about what's a sunnah clothing. Huh? A lot of videos circulating and all the time. We don't need to get into that d discussion at the moment, but this one liner that I just gave you, is that dress what the pious people of the town dress in. And dress in a manner that will protect you from provocations from the people of falsehood. Dress in a manner that will keep you protected from sin, invitation towards sin. Think about that. Dress in a manner that will... Youth, I'm talking to the youth here. College boys and girls, high school boys and girls. Dress in a manner that the opposite gender is not necessarily now, they're moving away from you. Yes, you look handsome, your car that you just came out of, wow, mashallah, it's great. But guess what? The way you're looking right now with your turban and with your thobe, with your topi and your whatnot, uh, no thanks. There you go. Now if you got your nice car also, a nice pair of everything else also, mashallah, you're an easy target. And do you, as men standing here listening to me, you think you're going to be able to handle that? And the same will apply to women. That dress in a manner, not just modest, but in a manner that a man will say, of the, you know, who's, who has evil intention, that uh-uh, this is not my type of person who's going to come and do haram with me. This is not someone who would be interested in me and I'm not interested in her. Just think about this parameter, what I just gave you. Dress in the manner of the pious and in a manner that will keep you protected from the invitations towards sin. If we keep this in mind, inshaAllah, wa ta'ala, a lot of ease and comfort, you'll be able to follow the deen. Inna amanna. As for us, O Fir'aun, amanna bi Rabbina, we have be believed in our Lord. Liyaghfira lana khatayana, so that He may forgive us for our misdeeds. Why did we believe in Allah? We want Allah to forgive us. And for whatever sorcery you have forced upon us, we never wanted to follow be sorcerers and magicians. You forced us to work for you. And we didn't know any better. We didn't get the proper exposure. Ya Allah, forgive us for our sins. And for the fact that we were involved in sorcery and magic due to Fir'aun forcing it upon us. Wallahu khayru abqa. For Allah is the best in reward and everlasting in punishment. What does khayr mean? Best. Abqa, everlasting. Can you, can you think of what this, this, verse of, this verse may be connected with? Khayru abqa. What is it connected with? Who remembers the reference to it in the last verse? Huh? Yes, Fir'aun, what did he say? He said, Ashaddu adabu abqa. He said, we're going to find out who can give a longer lasting punishment and a more severe punishment. And what they answer? They said, Allahu khayru abqa. It's not you. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's best in His reward and He's everlasting in His punishment. Because why? Once I die, you have no control over me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had control of, over me in the dunya and Allah has control over me in the grave as well. And Allah has control of me when He raise, resurrects me. And Allah has control of, of me in the hereafter. 
Then the, indeed they said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَأْتِي رَبَّهُ مُجْرِمًا Indeed, whoever comes to his Lord as a defiant unbeliever. And there, and mashallah, look at the iman, how quickly. Whoever comes as a defiant unbeliever to his Lord, فَإِنَّ لَهُ جَهَنَّمْ For him will be hell. He will go to hellfire. Okay. Now, لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا Wherein he shall neither die nor live without pain. Very important description of Jahannam. Jahannam is a place where you don't live nor you die. Because you can't call that life. You can't call that life. It's the worst possible thing. We, can, we can't even imagine how much, how horrible, right, Jahannam is. We, we just had the retreat in May and we had a whole talk on Hellfire, if you remember. So if you weren't there or if, even if you're there, you can scroll up and listen to it from the Memorial Day weekend retreat which focused on the uh, uh, death and what comes after death. So there was a specific talk or two on the hellfire. SubhanAllah. Remember listening to that. I think Muhammad Salman, uh, what's his name? Muhammad Mahtar. I think so. He gave that talk. Is that right? Right? So it was, uh, it was, it's, it's a very great reminder listening to what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about Jahannam? You can't call that life. Okay, how about death? Can we just die? Absolutely not. Death will be brought in the form of a ram. And the people of Jannah and the people of Jahannam will be told, Ajaw, come, 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 come. We have, there's a show here. So all the people of paradise and the people of the hellfire will come to the corners to watch the show. And Allah Azza wa will bring ram, a ram and say, this is death, okay? What will happen? And then the ram will be slaughtered. So if death was not dead at that time, the people of paradise would have died out of happiness. And if death was not dead, the people of hellfire would have died out of sadness. Realizing that there is no way out of this place. What's the opposite of that? Is only death in Jahannam? No. وَمَنْ يَأْتِي مُؤْمِنًا And whoever comes to him as a believer, not as a disbeliever, defined disbeliever. قَدْ عَمِلَ الصَّالِحَاتِ He comes as a believer, having done righteous deed. فَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمَ الدَّرَجَاتِ الْعُلَىٰ Then it is for these whom they are the highest ranks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Jannah is there waiting for you, but you have to have faith and good deeds, otherwise nothing is waiting for us. Jannatu Adn, gardens, Adn, everlasting gardens. Tajri min tahtiha al anhar, beneath which rivers flow. Khalidina fiha, wherein they shall abide forever and ever. For eternity, these people will enjoy Jannah. Wadalika jaza uman tazakka, for such is the reward of whoever purifies himself. Jaza means recompense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, This is the recompense of the person who does tazakka. What's tazakka? To attain purity of the heart. And that's what we're talking about what a shaykh or a mentor does. And that's what coming into gatherings like this is supposed to do. And that's what reading books and tazkiyah does. And that's what having a regiment of daily dhikr does. Is to purify the filth from the heart of arrogance, of uh, uh, narcissism, of love for material things, of lustful desires, of ostentation and show, of love and indulgence into material things of jealousy, of malice and hatred, all of these evil diseases of the heart, gluttony, etc. These things have to be cleansed out. Uh, one filter you don't clean in your car, one filter you don't clean in the AC. How many filters, how many things we have to clean, man? Every day our house, from toilet bowl to the sink, to the, to the kitchen, to the dishes, to every single thing in our home, from the garden to inside and outside, the porch, you name it, has to be washed, has to be rinsed, has to be power washed, has to be sweeped, has to be broomed. That's the dunya. So we are spending so much time cleaning all the cobwebs everywhere, but we have forgotten to clean the heart. How often and how many times have we thought, hey man, I must, I, probably, I, I, haven't, I haven't cleansed my heart. For, I haven't even seen what's inside there. We've got the deodorants, we've got the toothpaste, we've got the colognes, we've got everything else, the shampoos and the conditioners. What are we going to, when are we going to attend to our heart? Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ the one who purifies his heart, aflah, he's, gone, he's become successful. Qad aflah man zakkaha. Indeed, he who purifies the heart has become successful. These are multiple verses in the Quran that speak about the same thing. So this is a discussion that we have to have at home and with ourselves. That I need to work on the purification of my soul. Beloved fathers and mothers, when was the last time? You, we worry about our children's hygiene. We worry about their clothes and their looks and the uniform and their suits and what the, how they are dressed up. I have to dress up. You can never dress up for the wedding and the walima and the sanchak and the mendi and all everything else is the same. I mean, that was for women. No, men today also. They have to have, everything has to be different. 
none of this is nothing. There's no proof for any of this stuff. None of this is sunnah. But we have to have different clothing. We have to be in, you know, we have to be presentable for all of these things. What when are we as moms and dads gonna make fikr of the tazkiyah of our children? That has their tazkiyah been done? Has the nafs been uh, you know, brought smaller? Ha, ha, do, when you see these type of evil traits, do you just look the other eye and say, look the other way and say, as long as son, daughter, you've got the good grades, I'm not worried about it. That's not their response. We have to see what is the condition of their spirituality. وَلَقَدْ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَى مُوسَى Thus we reveal to Musa alayhi salam, an asri bi'abadi set out by night with my servants. My servants referring to the children of Israel. فَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ طَرِيقًا Then strike for them a dry passage فِي الْبَحْرِ Through the sea. Yabasan means dry. Darava means to strike. I want you to take, you know the story, the Fir'aun and his army is coming behind. Musa alayhi salam and the Bani Israel are moving forward. Now they say, إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ We're caught. We're caught. Behind us we have Fir'aun and his army. And in front of us we have the, uh, the, the sea. What should we do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Oh Musa, strike, take that stick that you just used to ev- evaporate and kill and eat up. Talqaf ma sana'u, all the other fake sorcery and magic and fake snakes of the magicians. MashaAllah, take that same stick. It's, it's, not what you think it is. it's not what you think it to be. It is what I want it to be. We talked about that last week, right? It is what I want it to be. So what did I want it to be right now? Right now I want to make the stick into something that makes water into land. And then after that, I'm going to change the properties of the stick that is going to become the same stick will make le- uh, hard stone into gushing water. Take the, the, the Bani Israel said we need water. Allah said take that same stick and hit the stone. Ya Allah, I'm going to break my stick. Hit the boulder. What's this going to do? How does my hitting a stick boulder going to do anything? Don't worry about it. As soon as he hit the boulder, 12 different streams began to flow from there. That same stick, a, few, uh, a little while before that, what happened? He tells him to strike the sea, and the sea turns into land. And a little bit before that, he says, take that stick and strike, throw it on the floor. It becomes the biggest snake and eats up all the other snakes. So we learn that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, it is what, it wants, what He wants us to be. It's not what we think of it to be. Whatever we own is what Allah wants it to be. That's why I ask Allah to make every resource you have beneficial. You don't know what's going to turn against you. You don't know. Who, when, where will turn against you. Don't ever have hope on upon anyone or anything. Have hope upon Allah only. The thing that you think is going to benefit you, as Ali anhu said, إِحْبِبْ حَبِيبَكَ هَوْنَمَّا عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَكُونَ بَغِيضَكَ يَوْمَمَّا Love your friend with moderation. Love your friend with moderation. Don't overlove him and open up everything to him. One day, it could happen that he may turn against you and become your enemy and will use every secret that you had shared with him to destroy your life. وَبْغِضْ بَغِيضَكَ هَوْنَمَّا And hate your enemy also with moderation. Because it could happen that one day this enemy of yours may become your friend. And if you've done too much harm to each other's relationship, that relationship may never be able to go back to or go to a, a place of you know, kindness and goodness and understanding. You don't want to burn the bridges. SubhanAllah, what beautiful statement. So don't overtrust anyone. Instead, trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, make my spouse, make my children, make my grandchildren, make my money, make my home, make my car, make my business, make my partners in the business. Make these all means of khair and goodness for me and do not allow them to become a means of fitna and test for me. Right? Because you don't know when, where something will turn against us. And what will happen, Ya Allah, if I sit, if I t- t- strike the ocean and the sea with my staff? La ta- it'll turn into... into, into uh, a dry passage لا تخاف دركا and don't be fear don't fear be, by being overtaken they're looking around they're looking behind them they say oh Firaun is right behind them inna la mudrakun same word daraka mudrakun we're caught oh Musa we're caught what did you do to us <coughs> and what did Musa respond in 19th juice qala kalla never 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 you're going with me relax we don't, we're not gonna, I'm not leading you to to, to, to difficulty that's what happens when you follow the deen stop thinking the deen will lead you to your destruction when you, when you follow the Prophet ﷺ, Sunnah, I promise you, you will not be thrown off the cliff. Deen is where success is. But we, Allah tests us. 
We have to stay invested. If you, if you ever invested in the stock market, what happens? You just, oh, we lose the money, pull that out. Is that how it works? You'll never get, you're going to lose all your money like that if you do that. What happens? You have to, ups and downs come in the market, but you have to, slow and steady wins the race. You stay, you stay calm no matter what happens. Right? I'm not giving financial advice here, please. I'm just giving some basic ideas here. Is that when a person is, sees things happening that are not what he's expecting, you, can, you have to remain firm. You can't just run away. So when we are following the deen, following the sunnah, Allah will test us. And our job is to say, Ya Allah, I love you, and I love the deen, and I'm not going anywhere. No matter what comes my way. You open up a halal business, you're losing money on it. Relax. You, I was making haram, I, in my haram business, I was make, I've, I've had people tell me this. Haram business, I was making so much money. Now I'm in halal, I'm losing money. So what? I mean, this is a test from Allah. You want to go back to the haram? That's the biggest adab to keep Allah for you in a haram business. Then what other bigger punishment? To keep you in riba, to keep you in interest, to keep you into selling haram, uh, to keep you in spending haram. This is a punishment of Allah already. So if Allah got you out of that haram and you're not making that much money or you're losing money, no problem. This is a test. But stay firm. Don't run away from this. Don't, so Allah tells Musa, darakan, don't, be, don't fear of being overtaken by Pharaoh. Wala taqsha, and don't, nor, do not be dread, have any dread or fear of drowning. They went in, and surely right after them, Fir'aun followed them with his forces. Atba'a means to follow, bijunudi with his forces. What happened? Fa'ghashiyahum. Ghashiya yaghsha means to overwhelm, to be over. Ghashiya. Hal ataka hadithul? Ghashiya. Have you heard the news of the overwhelming incident? What is the overwhelming incident? What is it? Anyone know? Huh? What is it? Yawmul Qiyamah, the day of judgment. What a name. Allahu Akbar. There's 20 plus names of the day of judgment in the Quran. And each one is, we ha, is, is amazing. Mulan Ihtaram gave a beautiful talk on that in the retreat as well. On the signs of the day of judgment. Uh, names of the day of judgment. So ghashia means something that overwhelms you. Allah Azza wa says, they were overwhelmed by the sea and what an awesome whelming it was. This is such a beautiful ayah. Allah doesn't say a great big wave came overtook them. Allah says, I'm not... I, just they were overwhelmed by what was overwhelming. Allah doesn't even call it a wave. Allah doesn't even explain how big it was. He's just like, you know, when you just say it's something is just so huge, it was just so huge. I can't even tell you, right? It's not you're not going to say five feet or ten feet. It was just unbelievable. So this is a this is the uh, the tabir that's used here in the Quran. This is the figure of speech. That what overtook them was just something unbelievable. Thus Fir'aun ended up leading his people astray. This is what you call what they call a double su- what they call double homicide or what they call that? Su- what's that? When you kill someone and you kill yourself. What do they call that? Murder suicide. This is what he did. Murder suicide. He took everyone to hellfire and he took himself to hellfire. That's what he did. Adallah Fir'aun qawmahu. Thus Fir'aun led his people astray. and did not guide them. Even though he said, Don't follow Musa, follow me. I'm the one who's gonna guide you. He's trying to ruin your life. Remember? Musa is trying to take away your freedoms. So we actually now found out what happened. This story of Musa and Fir'aun will move on to a, a new uh, chapter, inshallah, from next week. But the idea here is every single Pharaoh must come to an end similar to this. And all followers of every Pharaoh will also have a similar ending. That's why Allah mentioned this story here in the Quran. For us to understand, okay, that don't follow the Pharaohs of your time. Follow the Musas of your time. Even though it may seem not cool, it may seem that it's difficult. It may seem life is challenging, but you will win the race. You will have the last laugh. We talked about that last week too. How the believers will the ones who will be having the last laugh on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant you and I the ability to remain steadfast um, on our deen. And, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have the basira and the understanding to stay away from all the forces of evil. Here's the quick um, QR code if you want to ask any questions uh, on Slido here. Um, and uh, the phone number is 124, I mean, slido.com, and 1246099. <laughs> 1246099, <laughs> 1, if you want to ask any questions. I want to, um, inshallah, I'll take a moment to do some dhikr right now, and then we'll answer the questions. Okay, okay. Do a few minutes of dhikr. Today is Isha Jama'a is 9:45. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. 
لا إله إلا الله 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 محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا إله إلا الله 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 محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد 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 صلى الله عليه وسلم استغفر الله 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 الذي لا اله الا هو الحي القيوم واتوب اليه someone said i feel good but i want to know how to get an unknown weight off of my chest so you know it, uh, again all a lot of the brothers and sisters ask questions if you be a little bit more detailed when you send a question that can help answer cuz you know what type of if you've got if you're wearing weights around your neck maybe you should take that off you know what i mean <laughs> i don't know or a very expensive heavy heavy gold jewelry so obviously if you're talking about a sin uh, then in that case the way to take off the chest is to cry in front of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you cannot shed tears then at least pour your heart out and make dua to allah subhanahu that's the best way to do that uh, and dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very beautiful When you do the dhikr of Allah Like we just did three things we'll Take Allah's name Send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And do istighfar Very great way to uh, to, 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 make your, to make your To make your mind and heart feel refreshed Right So praying two rakat salah Pouring your heart out Asking Allah for forgiveness And doing dhikr is great 
uh, how do I uh, stay, uh, I keep falling into the same sin again and again, how do I uh, give, uh, uh, leave the sin, the sin? So this is where, uh, you know, uh, a person who has a, 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 a you keep on getting a, a sinus, you keep on getting a cough every single week, every single day, you keep on bleeding nonstop. Do you just start, you know, figuring things out off of Google? Or do you actually go visit a doctor? Same thing. When the people have issues like this, spiritual issues, you can't usually so take care of these things on your own. You need to reach out to a mentor or a sheikh or a scholar, you know. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of resources here at Darussalam. And Alhamdulillah, reach out, email, through email, through whatever, text, etc. And say, okay, how do, I, how do I assist myself in this type of situation? Uh, basic thing for general for sins is that a person needs to leave the environment uh, and uh, leave the friend circle that leads to that. And if it's, if it's connected to a device, connected to a place, then there's no, there's, no, there's no rocket science required. A person, as long as they've got those devices around them, as long as they're in that environment, they're going to keep on falling into sin again and again. That's simple as that. So we have to remove ourselves from those uh, places where the sins are happening, including keeping ourselves away from, from cell phone devices, that, which is the one biggest thing. Um, do sins block your dua from being answered? If a person does not repent those sins, repent from sins, and he continues to lead a life of, uh, of insolence and, uh, and a life of, 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 of sin where he doesn't care what Allah thinks, then yes, this could be a reason why his ibadah might not be accepted depending on what type of sin it is. So the, best, the, best, the first dua you want to make is, Ya Allah, forgive me. That's the dua, the first dua. Ya Allah, forgive me for what I've done, major and minor sins. Make that dua and then you move on to everything else. How do you know when it's time to stop trying for a career or for marriage? How do you know when it's to just let go? You need to have a career, brother or sister. You know, whatever the case may be. And you need to get married too. There's no time. There's no such thing as get, getting, you know, it's over. You have to get married also and you have to have, to have sustenance. So you got to keep on trying. Again, there might be some obstacles in you specifically that you're faced with and some obstacles that you don't see and you don't sense. So you need to reach out to a scholar and ask specifically about your situation. Neck chains, rings, etc. Are men allowed to wear? No. The uh, only thing that men are allowed to wear are a uh, only thing for the not for the sake sake of beauty also for the sake of Rasulullah the way he did it he wore he had a silver ring specifically used for stamping, right? That was his signature on it. So that's what it is. But zina and, and beautification through jewelry is not a man, is not a man, is not a thing for the men in this world. Akhirah will be something else. Um, how does one overcome mental illness and feeling alone? Subhanallah. I don't feel like I can do anything and feel bedridden. So there's, there's, uh, there's two things to this. There's one is the spiritual aspect of it, and there's one the psychological or the, uh, you know, psychiatric aspect of it too. So the, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, specifically reading manzil, the 30 verses of Quran, or reading what I usually recommend for everyone, you know, for whatever type of situation. The, you know, those of you who did atikaf, you know, something I've always give uh, uh, the tainanal, spiritual tainanal, seven times surah fatiha, seven times Ayatul Surah Fatiha, seven times Salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, seven times Surah Fatiha, seven times Ayatul Kursi, seven times Surah Quraysh, seven times the last four, Qul, Qul Yal Kafirun, Qul Allahad, Qul Adhfala, Qul Adhfala, Qul And seven times Surah Fatiha at the end. So this type of regiment, if you do this, seven, 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 each one, and after you finish reading each seven times, this has been shared by scholars, that you blow on your hands and wipe over your body and blow onto the water. And at the end you drink this water and do this regiment three to five times a day. Insha'Allah, whatever addiction you're f suffering from, or mental illness, spiritual, you know, things, if it's, from, if it's connected to a shaitan or connected to spiritual ailment, Insha'Allah, you'll get cured from it. If it requires medical intervention, then you've got to continue with that. But this, uh, this is a very effective way to removing our addictions also, and also falling into sin, I'm uh, sorry, falling into sadness and things of that sort, which is also definitely comes from shaitan. So that's again, seven times salawat, seven times surah fatiha, seven times al kursi. Seven times Quraysh and seven times four Qul. Am I saying order right? And then seven times Salawat at the end. Inshallah, if you do this with conviction and you think about the niyyah, why you're reading it, you do it for seven days, you do it for 14 days, you do it for 21 days, you do it for 41 days, do it an odd number of days, three to five times a day. Inshallah, you will find a lot of benefit. Again, reach out to the masjid, you know, and, and uh, meet, ask for, you know, text or email. Inshallah, alhamdulillah, we have great resources here. 
whatever we can, we'll try our best to help. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to um, accept all of you who came here. Whatever, all those whose questions did not get answered, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answer your questions in the quickest manner, in the best manner. And whatever issues and difficulties any one of us are going through, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, grant us najat from that. Subhanallah wa hamdi, subhanallah wa hamdi, inshallah wa la ilaha illa anta, nasafiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد الرسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حيا على الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استوى اعتذلوا الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين وكأي من قرية عتت عن أمر ربها ورسله فحاسبناها حسابا شديدا وعذبناها عذابا نكرا فذاقت وبال أمرها وكان عاقبة أمرها خسرا أعد الله لهم عذابا شديدا فاتقوا الله يا أولي الألباب الذين آمنوا قد أنزل الله إليكم ذكرا رسولا يتلو عليكم آيات الله مبينات ليخرج الذين آمنوا ليخرج الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات من الظلمات إلى النور ومن يؤمن بالله ويعمل صادحا يدخله جنات تجري جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا قد أحسن الله له رزقا الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين الله الذي خلق سبع سماوات ومن الأرض مثلهن يتنزل الأمر بينهن لتعلموا أن الله لتعلموا أن الله على كل شيء قدير وأن الله قد أحاط بكل شيء علما الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر 
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله أكبر استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله الذي لا إله إلا الله I request for your patience, inshallah, for a few minutes. Today is a very special day. Inshallah, we're going to be, inshallah, introducing some new members to our, uh, of our staff here. So I request everyone who doesn't, is in an absolute rush to give us five minutes. We actually, for this celebrity occasion, we have prepared sweets and all, uh, mashallah, f- to share with the community. So I request all, inshallah, to stay, s- stay settled for a few minutes, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, any effort of deen that happens doesn't happen in a vacuum. It requires a lot of different uh, efforts put together of different people. And so Darul Salaam is no different. Whatever you see here, mashallah, 10 softs today for Salah, alhamdulillah, is a beauty, beautiful eff, uh, combination, combination of hundreds of people's of efforts for the past, you know, two decades or three decades. So what we see, of course, the masjid got built now in 2013, but before that, a lot of effort has been taking place. And those people uh, who are known by Allah Azza wa and maybe not known to us, have been a part of this journey. So as this caravan moves forward, we're, we are so blessed to keep on adding new people to our team. Where now currently, mashallah, we have over 75 part-time and full-time staff members. at Darul Salaam, alhamdulillah. Um, so most of us, we do, are not aware of all of them. But today I want to introduce three staff members who are joining us. And you will see them, because you'll be inter- uh, four of them who will be, inshallah, you'll be interacting with them. Um, these are not the only four that have joined, but inshallah, today at least I want to introduce them to you. And, um, and so I would have Mufti, Ta- Muf- Muf- Mufti Tahmeed, mashallah, who is joining our Hifz program, who joined already Hifz program. Alhamdulillah, we currently have now uh, about nine, 96 students in the, Hifz, in the boys section. 96 students, alhamdulillah, and then in the, bo- the girls about another 50. So we have approximately 9 to 10 Hifz classes. And maybe four to five in the girls' side. So Mufti, Mufti Tahmeed, he's joining us from Queens, New York. 
And alhamdulillah, he studied, um, uh, he started his journey of memorizing Quran at the age of 11. And then he finished his, uh, his hifz there and moved on to do the seven year alim, alim program. And then mashallah, he decided to further his education by doing the ifta or mufti course under Mufti Brar here at the Darul Ifta Chicago. And alhamdulillah, he joined right now uh, with us here to be one of the, uh, the, one of the hifz teachers. Mufti Hamid, where are you? Is you? Oh, yeah, ajay, inshallah. So I just wanted to um, introduce all of you. It's a takbir. Alhamdulillah. So he's our latest uh, addition to the teaching staff of Darul Salam of the Highest Program. Next, I'd like to introduce Ahmed um, um, Ahmed Salim, who's uh, uh, Alhamdulillah. Many of you have seen him. You've seen him serving the chai. And you don't know that he is the one who makes the chai as well, <laughs> right? So he's the, the director of. Uh, we're introducing his new position. Is going to be the director of Masjid Operations. Alhamdulillah, he graduated from Broward College of Nursing in 2018, after which he started his career as a registered nurse. A year later, he was promo promoted to a charge nurse position. And then after that, Alhamdulillah, in the pandemic, he switched over to the pandemic response travel nursing unit and responded to a crisis assignment about 20 minutes away from Darul Salaam. So while he was working in the COVID patients, during COVID era, he began to visit Darul Salaam. And Alhamdulillah, he fell in love with the students, the teachers, and the programs here. And mashallah, soon after, he decided to enroll in the Tanweer program last year. He graduated from the Tanweer program this past, last month, and, or, or in, in June. And mashallah, now he has joined here. He wanted to continue his studies. So he's joining here as a part-time uh, Takmil student of the Alim program of the second year, while taking on the position of the director of the Masjid operations. So he's officially in this capacity. He will, inshallah, ta'ala, taking care of all our events, the, the, the masjid events, the retreats, the workshops, uh, the larger uh, fundraisers, um, and of course our this annual this this the the, uh, um, the divine reality workshop. Alhamdulillah, that's here. So Ahmed, uh, mashallah. Along with that, he's you know mashallah still taking care of the tea and and serving all of you. So I want you all uh, give him a warm welcome, takbir, uh, for the dedicated sacrifice he's making. Subhanallah, giving up. Everything and what's interesting, I want if, if with your permission, Alhamdulillah, Inshallah, Bidilahi Taala, he's gonna get married soon as well. But so many times people say, brother, you gonna you study the deen, you gonna get married. That's a lot of people say, by the way. And what's amazing is that may Allah preserve and protect his marriage to be, Inshallah. But the the, what, the girl side, they said, you know, we got a lot of proposals from different engineers, doctors, lawyers, whatnot. But the fact that you are leaving that to come stay in the madrasa and to study the deen, this is something which we feel is the best thing for our daughter. We want someone who will take care of the deen of our daughter. So what I want to tell you is that when you give preference to the deen, doesn't mean you're going to left on the street. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you more than everyone else. It just seems like that from outside. Oh man, he has to make a lot of sacrifice. Actually, you have no idea how much happiness and joy Allah gives to people who make sacrifices for the deen. Right? Outside it seems like the other people are enjoying it. But in reality, those who, who make the big sacrifice, Allah will give them not only Jannah insha'Allah, but in this dunya they will have a very enjoyable, comfortable life as well. And next I'd like to introduce the director of the seminary operations, Wasim Kaleem. He also, many of you have seen him. He was raised in New York, studied finance and accounting. He was an advisor at Tesla, and then he worked for a private firm on Wall Street. Last year, he quit his job to pursue uh, his, uh, the Tanweer program. Alhamdulillah, Ahmed and Wasim together were the older brothers for the whole student body over here. They took the Umrah group of 75 plus students. They handled all the day-to-day -day affairs of the student body. They were, uh, they were available always there to listen to the children, students who were going through a rough time, helping them you know, adjust to the madrasa life, etc. So Alhamdulillah, they were like our right hand and left hand here in the madrasa. May Allah reward them and bless them. So now they fell in love again with the environment and said, you know what, we're not going anywhere. So he's moved from New York and joined our staff here and he is now going to be director of the seminary Operations, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him. Where your brother Wasim, where are you? MashaAllah. Uh? Takbir. All right, alhamdulillah. Amazing sacrifice. These brothers who have given up what, they, what they've, they, were, they studied for to give, invest their time and their youthful years, mashaAllah, in the greatest place, which would be a place of deen. We look at the crowd here. How many, mashaAllah, youngsters are here? And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Brother Ali Siddiqui, a Siddiq from the director of uh, Tadris program, the Integrated Alim and High School program. A little short bio of him, he was born and raised in Miami, Florida, completed his uh, uh, BBA in marketing and international business in 97, went on to complete his MBA in 2000. He worked in the industry in various positions, and then in 2008, he moved on to Saudi Arabia to teach at the Yambur University College in the School of Management Sciences. And after teaching various courses there as a lecturer and, and quality assurance department, etc., 2012, he returned to serve the deen. He came back to Miami. The Islamic 
School of Miami, ISOM, was just about to start its full-time school when he assumed the position of the director. At that time, there were only 13 students, and mashallah, under his leadership for the past years, it grew to a student, of, a student body of 120 students. And more importantly, beyond that, it transitioned to, uh, to data-driven instruction. In the 2021-22 academic year, the Islamic School of Miami was able to achieve the coveted Kogna accreditation for K-12, and mashallah has the, uh, the highest level, the highest uh, uh, you know, marks in the country in that, in, according to the Islamic School Federation. Imagine that, 97 percentile was rated by this accreditation company or accreditation board. And under his leadership, alhamdulillah, with deen and sunnah, along with the most outstanding scores from K through 12. So we are so excited that he is joining our team here, um, alhamdulillah, to, uh, to, to, to bring life to the tadris Inten- Tadris Integrated High School Program, Brother Ali, where, is it? where are you? MashaAllah. All right, so, um, Takbir. Takbir. Allah Akbar. So, he made this huge sacrifice of leaving his elderly parents. May Allah grant them siha and shifa. And may Allah allow them to join him here as well. As obviously, he's, he made a huge sacrifice for the deen to come and serve this community. So, we, are so, we don't have words of appreciation for all these brothers and these ulama for the, what they're doing for us, for you all, for me, for your children, my children. But we simply ask Allah to reward them in the most high manner. I will ask Ali Bay to share a few words, inshallah. Just a few words of, 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 of encouragement to us as well, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, we won't, we'll keep it short. There's brownies, there's sweets, all of those things that Mona Farhan Jazakallah Khaira prepared as the happiness of this occasion today. We usually have the normal chai stuff, but beyond that, he added some other things as well for this happy occasion. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Asatu Sallam, Wa Alaikum Wa Sallam. We had actually agreed that we wouldn't speak, but I guess not with Mufti Sa. So, yes, he did not agree with me. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Allah bless all of you. Actually, it's a great honor uh, to be here. I don't feel, uh, I, when Mufti bin Hajj had told me to, to join, I told him, I don't think I'm the right person. You need to find someone else. And I still don't feel worthy of this place. But I don't know if any of you also the weight and the real, you don't know what the rest of the country feels about this place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it a great position and that great position is because of all of you. The people who stand in the front in any organization, anyone, they're the face. But the blood, we don't see our blood. It's inside. The blood that's running is you people. So, alhamdulillah, you've brought this to such a great, such a great position in the country, and inshallah, in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most importantly, I'm just here trying to help, inshallah, so I can also be a part. So on the Day of Judgment, when the book is open, the register is open about this institute and all the accomplishments, so my name can be in that register somewhere. So inshallah, I'll be here. Anything, uh, uh, inshallah, you have any questions about, I'm still learning about the Tadris, about the LAM program. Um, we want it to become, inshallah, uh, actually uh, in the, the outlook, the vision ahead that uh, in just like today in this country, people are bringing their children uh, for, for the Alamiya program, that it's so great that one, uh, if we reach a point in which inshallah, that even the academics are so great that we want to put our children in this, in this institute. And this will happen, inshallah, this will happen through your du'as, and this will happen through your, uh, through your efforts, through your suggestions, through your help. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make, uh, use me too and use all of you. Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair, ameen, abul alameen. Last but not least, brothers, one, one more minute here, inshallah. This weekend, alhamdulillah, as you've heard, that the Divine Reality Workshop is taking place called God, Islam, and the Mirage of Atheism. I just want to cover the topics. Friday, it'll start at 8 p.m. to 10. We're going to be covering the definition of atheism and implication, implications of atheism, meaning life without God. What does that mean? Saturday at Dhuhr, we're going to do, start at 2 p.m. Dhuhr, 1.30, till Maghrib. It was going to cover self-evident, why atheism is unnatural. Then we're going to cover the divine link, the argument from dependency. And number three, has science disproven God? Deconstructing false atheist assumptions. And then Sunday, inshallah, 10 a.m. to 1 till Dhuhr is going to be a universe from nothing, the Quran's argument for God. Number two, God's testimony, the divine authorship of the Quran. And lastly, the free slave, the intuitive need to worship and why God is worthy of that worship. So this is book, The Divine Reality, 
It's going to be, it's available on Amazon. We'll have a few, some available for purchase as well. Uh, I, I request, I've been announcing passionately after every salah and every night that this is a, a must for every single young adult and mom and dad to attend this course to learn how to protect this, our children from this, the face of this enemy. So this is the first time, to my knowledge, in this entire region, a program like this is taking place, alhamdulillah, for the whole weekend. I request every single one person, you've heard it, there's students standing here, they have a QR code in their paper. I just request you to please take a picture of the QR code and right now register within, within the next minute or so. So that you can, once you've got your foot, your foot into the door, you can inshallah become ambassadors of this weekend's program and invite others. This is not a luxury. This is not a vitamin. This is what I call a painkiller. We have to be prepared to address these issues uh, in front of, when our children ask these questions and let us not think that, oh, I'll wing it. If you wing it, and you wing it improperly, Allah forbid, your child may lose their faith. Right? That's what it is. That's what it comes down to. So I request everyone, inshallah, to please register for the program, and please invite everyone to join us here Friday evening as Ustad Fahad Taslim, inshallah, will be uh, delivering these programs. He'll be giving the Jummah Khutbah more than likely at IFS. And uh, he will be spending the day with the seminary students here also on Thursday. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all of your patience. And you're sitting here after your sunnah. Please enjoy the brownies and the, and the sweets outside in the courtyard. Jazakumullah khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.